when we're started, I'll start with prayer. All right. Lord, we thank you for this time as we come to uh, learn about what it means to proclaim your message, Lord, to learn about what it means to share our faith, Lord. I hope that we can be encouraged to do so. Um, I thank you for those who are here to learn, and um, I just pray that as we go through this, that you would help us receive and understand and hopefully put into practice. And in your son's name we pray, amen. All right, I'm going to actually close this real quick since we are starting. Okay, so first uh, lesson in this class is what is evangelism? That is the title of our lesson today. Real quick before I start, I just want to get a quick um, poll. How many of you guys have gone out to share your faith? Gone out, yeah, yeah, why not? Just out to the street. Yeah. Yeah, good deal. All right, how many of you guys have just done it in witnessing to one-on-one -on -one with someone? Just, okay, good deal. Good deal. Well, uh, hopefully, as we go through this, if you guys go out again, uh, just one of the things is we do, obviously here, third Wednesday of the month, we do evangelism, so good opportunity to go out and share your faith as well but hopefully you can be encouraged to do it more than just that so anyways all right here we go what is evangelism if we are to study the task of evangelism we should take time to think about what exactly we are talking about is evangelism just going out to the street with your soapbox and preaching is it putting invitations to come to our church in the hands of the general po population? Is it convincing an Arminian that the doctrines of grace are true and biblical? Is it getting people to leave their church and come to ours? What we envision evangelism to be will drive our thoughts about the ministry of evangelism. For example, if you think that you must be trained to be an evangelist, you will probably leave the task to those who are trained, those with the training. If you think evangelism isn't evangelism until you are about to, until someone is about to beat you up, you'll probably become rough and abrasive, thinking you're doing doing it right, but you're probably just being a jerk. So the question is, where are we going? There are essentially three main ideas that are going to be covered. One, what is evangelism, which is what we're doing today and next week. Two, why should we evangelize? And three, how should we evangelize? As we look to each section, it is my hope not only are you equipped to do the work of evangelism, but encouraged to share your faith with confidence and boldness. To start, we are going to discuss what evangelism is. So we may work through the rest of our time using the same definitions and ideas to make our conversation helpful and beneficial to you in your attempts to share your faith. When beginning a discussion about evangelism, the defining of terms is the first step. We need to know that we are on the same page talking about the same things. Without, without doing this, the ability to communicate clearly and the ability to comprehend will be hindered. Talking definitions is not an exciting task to do, but a very vital and necessary one. We will not have a clear discussion about evangelism unless we take the time to talk about what evangelism is and what is our message. So the first subtitle is Proclamation. The first thing to understand is, is that to evangelize is to proclaim a message. We need to understand that we are sharing the, a message of all that Christ has done for his people and making a way for them to be reconciled to God. Jesus is our example in proclamation. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, the first thing Jesus does to begin his public ministry is to proclaim the message of the kingdom calling people to repent and believe the gospel. That's uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. Jesus ultimately teaches and preaches about who he is and what he has come to do. Everything that Jesus did was to broadcast the message that he, the Son of God, had come in order that the world might be saved through him. John three seventeen. We should also think about those whom Christ sent into the world to proclaim the message as well. Jesus, in the end of the Gospels, commissions his apostles to go into the world 
and proclaim the gospel of Christ to the ends of the earth. Mark and Luke have proclamation explicit in their endings. Mark 16, 15 says this, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Then in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 46 through 48, says this, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. We see that the main job of the apostles was to go into the world and proclaim the gospel of Christ. They were to take what they saw and proclaim it to everyone they could. The book of Acts mentions the apostles were called witnesses by Christ. This is an appropriate word for a witness testifies what they proclaim and proclaims what they saw, heard, and experienced. Everything they did was to testify that Jesus was the Christ, whether in personal conversation, public declaration, even in the suffering of persecution in the agony of martyrdom. They testified to who Jesus was and what Jesus had done. My last example is the Apostle Paul himself, who was always looking for anyone to evangelize. In fact, Paul called it a matter of first importance in his first letter to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 3, I'll skip verse 2, it says this, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached or proclaimed to you, which you received in which you stand. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Paul preached or proclaimed the gospel and held it up as the most important thing that he could say to the Corinthians. This makes sense because near the beginning of that letter, Paul talks about how he decided to know nothing among them but Christ crucified. Paul wrote to the Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. This shows that Paul understood that if he did not proclaim the gospel, then the power of the gospel would be stifled and made impotent. So the next part then is the message that we are to proclaim. We have proclamation. Now what is that message? What is great about the message that we are called to proclaim is that it is easy to remember. Christ died for the forgiveness of sins. There isn't any more to the message. We need to remember that only as we grow in our faith, we will come to a deeper understanding of the message and its implications on our lives. But to become a Christian, it is the bare minimum. Paul gives a pithy statement in the, of the gospel by saying, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's Romans 10.9. Yes, the message is a simple one. It is only our sinful nature that wants to add qualifiers or stipulations or works to the message of the cross. We should be like Paul and decide to know nothing but Christ crucified. What is amazing is that although we can boil down the message to a simple sentence, there are many implications tied to it. This points to the fact that within the message are ideas and presuppositions that can guide our thinking as we look to proclaim Christ. The basic message of the gospel is needed to become a Christian, but the deeper meanings become the means of discipleship and spiritual growth as we follow and learn from our Lord. Let's look briefly at the two component components of Romans 10.9. Um, the next verse afterwards says this, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That's Romans 10.10. 10. We see correlations to each part, meaning repentance and faith, in the following verse after. Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, followed by with the mouth one confesses and is saved as well as believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, followed by with the heart one believes and is justified. 
we should think about more about what these things mean. To confess Jesus as Lord is to make a positive declaration about who Jesus is. Normally, we use the phrase Lord and Savior to be a bit more precise about what we mean. If Jesus is Lord, then Savior is clearly one of his works, because the God of the Old Testament was clearly a saving God, as put on display by the account in Exodus. As God saved his people from a slavery that they were unable to free themselves from, if as God saved his people from a slavery that they were unable to free themselves from. If Jesus is Lord, especially in the full understanding of that word, Savior then is one of the things we confess about who he is. Confession is also a positive declaration of our own sinfulness before a holy God. Sorry about that. Before a holy God. This would be the first act of repentance as to see who we really are considering who Christ is. If we confess Jesus as Lord, we are not only seeing him as Savior, but also acknowledging that he is the holy and righteous judge of the universe, with whom we must deal with. This should cause us to beg and plead for mercy at his feet, with hope that by some means we may see mercy. In these couple of ideas, we see that there is depth to the confession of Jesus as Lord. To agree that Jesus is Lord, however, is not enough when proclaiming the message. If we stop there, we'll only make more devils. James writes, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Paul writes, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. How does this work together? It would be because we must believe that Christ has died for our punishment and his resurrection is the work, is evidence that Christ's work is effectual. <clears throat> if the soul that sins shall die, as Ezekiel says, then what this means is that Christ took the punishment of Genesis 3 for us. Remember, in the day that you eat this fruit, you shall surely die. And if we believe that God has raised him from the dead, it means that Jesus first had to die in order to be raised, and that if he says who he says, he is who he says he is, then that means he died for our sins. And if the soul that sins shall die, the fact that he raised from the dead means that he didn't die for his sins, but for our sins. And so the question then, becomes, what am I believing in my heart then? Simply that Jesus, in being who he said he was, did what he said he did, and will save all that come to him. Being God's son, he lived the life we could not. He took the full wrath of God for sin. And because of this, Jesus satisfies the Father's wrath, so we don't have to. All that the sinner needs to do is repent of sin and put his faith in Christ. And God has promised justification from sin and reconciliation to life eternal with him. This is part of what is encompassed in the gospel message we should be proclaiming. All right. Now a couple of discussion questions. It's the interactive part. So the first question I have for you is as, we talk, as I talked about there being implications to the simple phrase I had, can you guys think of any other implications in the phrase, confess the Lord Jesus, or confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord? So we talked about the message is simple. And then when I talked about what does it mean to confess Jesus is Lord? One of those things is to confess that he is holy and righteous, right? He is the Lord. He's also Savior, right? Because if he's the Lord, he's the same Lord as the Old Testament, the God of the Old Testament was a saving God as well. So the other question then, as we think about what we're talking about, especially when we want to evangelize, we need to think about what are the implications of the things we're saying. So if I tell someone on the street that they need, they need to confess the Lord Jesus, what, you know, what are some meanings in that? What does that mean? What does it take to confess the Lord Jesus? Yeah.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very good. You'll want to repeat that in the video so the students can see it because they can't hear it anymore. Okay. So I'll say that as confession of Lord, that means that He is over us. He is Lord over us, which means we are subject to Him. That's a really good point because whether we believe in Christ or not, we're all subject to Him, <laughs> which is big, which is why confession of the Lord Jesus leads to repentance, right? It's going to be the first sign of repentance is to turn from ruling our own lives to being truly subject to God's will. Any other? Go ahead. It's an admitting that we're sinful mm-hmm. and that as a Savior, he, He's the only one who can die for our sins. Exactly. So admitting we're sinful and admitting that Jesus is the only one who could possibly be sinless. That's very good. Yeah. And scripture commands us to believe with our heart in addition to confessing with our mm-hmm. mouth. And there's no more to that believing with your heart. There's evidence mm-hmm. of believing with your heart. Yeah. There's, there's physical evidence of that that, that shows that he is your Lord, mm-hmm. that you are that you follow his commands and that you follow his commands. Yeah. That's actually my next question. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We can actually go there right now. It's perfectly fine. So the question is, are there any more implications of what it means to believe in your heart? And you just started talking about that. There's physical fruit. You know, there is evidence of a changed life. John the Baptist talks about fruit in keeping with repentance, right? And so what are some other implications if I actually believe in my heart that Christ raised from the dead? And I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord as well. What are some more implications of that? For me, one of the fun, if not the most fundamental thing of any human being believing in Jesus Christ is to truly truly to believe that God is. Mm-hmm. That there really is a God who is and even in society that's telling us to believe to a God. Yeah. The big challenge for our society is we haven't been able to prove to God. And so when you when you get to that point where you ask him into your heart, that's the beginning of the realization of look. Is the God and He can save you out there. You know, that God answers prayers for you. Mm-hmm. That's a big deal for people that are darkened or dead and dead in their trespasses. And that is a great, great point. The fact that to believe that God raised Him from the dead, first and foremost, believe that there's a God to even raise Christ from the dead. <laughs> you know, that's a very good point. Being specific about who that God is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so being specific that, you know, that being the glory of God and the praise of God, mm-hmm. that's just mm-hmm. the way that gets you to God. To yeah. God. Yeah, that's very important too, because there's a lot of people who will say that there's a God out there, but it is true. What God are we believing in? Is it the Hindu God who's just kind of everything, or is it the Muslim God, or even the Mormon God, since it is a different God? So that is a very good point. Anything else? Yeah. In believing your, your dad, you also um, need God's knowing that the, the work is complete and that God is, is showing it's complete. So we, we don't have anything more to do because he, he did what was required and he rose from the dead. So it's over. <coughs> There's no more need for us to do the work. Yeah, that, that is a great point, that there's no more to be added, right? If you believe he died and was raised again, then the work truly is finished. And that's a great point, a very great point. Um, <clears throat> and that's, you know, when you think about antinomianism and legalism, that's a great thing to understand, too. I mean, a, a lot of times in, in, a, in a Sinclair Ferguson's book, The Whole Christ, he talks about how sometimes we try to cure legalism with antinomianism and vice versa. But he likens that to you're trying to c- give someone a cure for poison by giving them another poison. <sighs> you know, What actually cures those two things is the gospel, right? So for the legalist to believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead means exactly what you said. There's no more work I do to become better with God. But for the antinomian, it's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6. How can we live any more to sin if we died to it because we were buried with him in his death and raised with him in his resurrection. Therefore, we should not be slaves to sin. That's a very good point. Um, Real quick, anything else? 
planet. I mean, I think if we're honest, we can probably be here all day talking about this, which is one of the glorious things about the gospel itself, right? The gospel message is easy. Christ died for, for the forgiveness of sins. Or even in Romans 10, like we talked about, right? Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. There's a lot that goes into that, right? One of the things I thought about is if I call Jesus Lord, then I should be following him and doing what he says, right? Jesus in the book of Luke says, you call me Lord, Lord, but don't, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Right? Very simple question. So my last discussion question, just as we're thinking about it, can we think of other pithy gospel statements within the New Testament? So what I think about is I think about like I had in Romans 10 here, right? Believe, uh, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. I also want to just kind of take the time to kind of brainstorm with you guys and think about it. Are there any other kind of gospel in a nutshell statements you can think about within the New Testament? And feel free to take your time on this. I'm kind of putting you on the spot and I know that. So... But I do want, want to just kind of let us think about these things because a lot of times when you're on the street, sometimes you only get 30 seconds to tell someone the gospel, <laughs> right? And having these pithy statements from the Bible itself is a really good tool to just be able to put our faith out there. So I want to take a second and think of something. Yeah. And then John three sixteen, everybody knows that. Yeah. We were limited on time and can't serve those two together to get there. I think they missed that. Yeah, that's a very good one. That's a very good combo. It's not one, but you know. Yeah, yeah, it's two. I mean, that's that's very good. <clears throat> uh, the first one I had, just to throw out because I had it in my mind, was uh, in Colossians chapter two. Um. Starting in verse 13, it says this, And you, being dead in your trespass and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirement that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it, taken it, out, on, taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed the principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them over it, triumphing over them in it. So handwriting of requirement, this takes a little bit of, of, of explanation, but we all know it. The handwriting of requirement is a modern day translation, is a rap sheet, right? A criminal has a rap sheet. And what Paul is saying is that we had a rap sheet against God, and God nailed that to the cross where the punishment was given, and now we are free of that rap sheet before God. It's a very pithy statement, right? And like I said, it just takes a little bit of time. And one of the reasons why I want us to think of these things is because if you only have a limited number of time, let's say you do come out with us downtown and you're handing out tracks, sometimes people are only going to give you 10, 15 seconds, which means you got to brush up on what you want to say <laughs> and make sure that you can do it. I also remember I had um, a guy say, you know, think about it. He was talking about it with politics, but he talked about the elevator co co conversation. Right? Could you say your point in the time it takes to get from the first floor to the fifth floor? If you only have that much time. So, anyways, real quick. Any others? Yeah. With the jailer when uh, Paul and Silas uh, were freed from prison, um, he yelled out that he was from the trembling city of Jesus, the place where he died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something that was always uh, good to my mind was uh, if a person is sitting in front of you telling you to read your Bible, mm -hmm. if you break your Bible, you can't talk. Yeah. So that was the one thing that I did was uh, yeah. it's uh, very powerful for, for me at least. Mm -hmm. I don't want to tell anybody I'm a believer in God, but I want to be very clear. Yeah. 
And you know, I mean, we'll talk about this later when we actually get into how, but you know, memorizing things like the Romans Road and things like that, those are good tools. I mean, people made those tools for the act of evangelism. So to use those things as they were intended are very good things. And so, yeah, if we want to put a, a couple verses together, that's perfectly fine too. The idea I'm just trying to get across is if you have 30 seconds, what do you say? Right? Or kind of like what Ray Comfort does to people. I've been stabbed in the back. I got two minutes to live. What do you tell me? Right? And what's crazy is that you can tell what people think of the gospel based on what they say. Like, in all reality, for someone who is, let's say, Catholic, where they, a believing Catholic, I should say, where they believe you must be baptized to be justified, if you got two minutes to live, you're in trouble. You know? <laughs> I mean, where are we going to get a priest? Where are we going to get you baptized? Where are we going to get you your last rites? Where are we going to get all this stuff? At least if you talk to a Mormon, they can just say, well, just, you know, believe, and we'll just baptize someone else in, in a, in a year, <laughs> you know, for you. But it's still, it's the idea, you can really see what people believe about the gospel. And that's what I want to really think about. Uh, Jason, it looked like you had something you were thinking about. Titus 3, 4. Okay. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's a good one, too. That's a very good one. Yeah, that's a good one. They find healing with the Jehovah's Witness, and you know, the, obviously their gospel is different. Mm -hmm. It's that uh, that that God's kingdom is coming, and that it will be established soon. Um, but uh, I point to I like to point them to First Corinthians fifteen one through four, but plainly Paul says, uh, "Be reminded, brothers, of the gospel that I preach to you, which is the gospel." Yeah. That Mm -hmm. the, the, so that one is is something you can give them real quick that says this is what scripture says the gospel is. Here's yeah. how you know it's coming along. Yeah, that's really good. Really good. Okay. Well, thank you for coming to class one. I'm gonna pray and uh, we'll get ready for church. Lord, we thank you for this time and we just pray that as we continue to go through these lessons, Lord, that uh, we would be encouraged, we would be equipped. We would, um, I also pray that you would remind us of these things so we could think of these things and meditate on these things and um, just uh, hopefully put them into practice and put them into use, Lord. I pray that we, that we don't forget our greatest weapon, which is your gospel, Lord. I pray that we can learn it in such a way that we can be swift and accurate with it. And in your son's name I pray, amen.